There was a pause before the Hawks were announced to give the fans a moment to thank Neek, which was enough time for Clippers guard Mark Jackson to push Wilkins out to the middle of the court to bask in the applause from the crowd. Neek was clearly emotional at the time, and I guess with very good reason. That was great stuff there from Mark Jackson. I really enjoyed that. He clearly understood the importance of the moment and made sure that Neek was aware of it as well pre-game. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So we're all getting first time thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, you made the pass. Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 123. Thanks for joining me. Today, we dive deep into the podcast archive. Six years ago, to be precise, back to 2015. My great mate, Aaron Steen, joined me to discuss Dominic Wilkins' return to Atlanta his first game versus the Hawks as a member of the Los Angeles Clippers. It's a fun, in my opinion, and insightful chat. Once you've listened to this conversation, I recommend episode 115, the great Danny Manning, NCAA champion, NBA All-Star, and Sixth Man of the Year, talks at length about his life in basketball. That conversation is a perfect complement to what you're about to hear. Show notes for this episode and access to a huge archive of past episodes are available at inallairness.com. Now, on to the show. Welcome back to another episode of In All Airness, Aaron. Today, mate, we're going to be chatting about a game that's near and dear to your heart for numerous reasons. March the 25th, 1994, the LA Clippers visited the Atlanta Hawks at the Omni in Atlanta, in front of 17,921 fans, a great crowd and with good reason, mate. Yeah, it's a game that I had, I guess, conveniently waited 21 years to try to watch. And uh, I have to thank a good friend of both of ours, Mr. Todd Spear, for, for putting me onto it because not having seen it for 21 years, I think it, it had really built up to a bit of a, uh, a fairy tale kind of a game for me to be able to get to see one day. So, yeah, I've got to thank Todd for getting me onto it. The primary reason, mate, for chatting about this game, of course, is related to the great Dominique Wilkins, the human highlight film. He was traded by the Atlanta Hawks on February the 24th of 1994. He was sent, along with the 1994 first-round draft pick, who would turn out to be Greg Miner, to the LA Clippers in exchange for Danny Manning. It's the first matchup between the two teams since the trade. In front of a, a bumper crowd, it must be said, of course, given that the two teams normally wouldn't draw that many fans, there was plenty of meaning for both teams, really, and we'll go into that in a bit more depth shortly, but just a, a great build-up to this game, and as you mentioned, it was great to have Todd send us an alleged copy of this game to have a look at, and I'm sure there's a couple of things you even wanted to mention before we get into the game itself. After having waited 21 years to watch the game, I watched it with a, a knot in my stomach. I'm not a Atlanta Hawks fan at all, but was a big Dominique fan during his playing days. And I still remember that moment back in 1994 when I learned that Dominique had been traded. It was probably two or three days after it actually happened, but that was uh, due to the coverage on the NBA in Australia back in 1994. And it almost could have been two to three weeks given the, the delays that we suffered here, having to wait so long, learning any news of note in newspapers, most likely, back in that time. The coverage of the game is from the Hawks Network, which is called Sport South, and the commentators are Tim Brando, who was a former CBS commentator, and Mike Stinger-Glenn. To begin the broadcast, Sports South, as you mentioned, started off with an image of an elderly woman standing with A4-sized Atlanta Hawk signs, stuck together with sticky tape, fashioned into a sleeveless T-shirt, which is a strange start in itself. But each one of these has the numbers 21 and 5 written on them with crosses through all of the number 5s. Now, this painted the picture for how Hawks fans, or I guess a majority of Hawks fans, felt about the trade 
They're sent Neek to the LA Clippers with a second round pick for Danny Manning. The coaches, Atlanta were led by Lenny Wilkins and the LA Clippers were led by Bob Weiss. Now, a couple of quick random facts here, mate. Overlooked in Neek's return to Atlanta is Bob Weiss himself. He actually coached the Hawks from 1991 through 1993 and he was now the head man in Clipperland. He also spent six seasons with the Bulls as a player and he averaged about 10 points and four assists a game. And he only coached the Clippers for this 1994 season. They went 27 and 55. His final role as a head coach was with the Seattle Supersonics in 2006. So a couple of interesting little tidbits there for what it's worth. The commentator spoke of Kevin Willis's great play since the trade of Dominique. Willis was averaging 20 points and 12 rebounds since Neek went to Los Angeles. They also mentioned the rivalry that Willis had with Neek in his time in Atlanta. Both players like to operate on the low block, and I get the feeling that with Neek getting preference that Kevin Willis wouldn't have been too upset to have seen Neek go. He clearly felt he was on the same level as Neek when he clearly wasn't. He was a very good player. Uh, did a lot of good things well. And I think he was a one-time All-Star in 1992, Kevin Willis. In this 93-94 season, it proved to be the best chance that the Hawks had at winning a title in a long time, either before or since. This Hawks team won 57 games and at one point early on in the season won 20 out of 23. They were 36-16 and 16 at the time of the trade, so it was a pretty adventurous move to make the trade. A lot of the LA Clippers vets were out of contract after this season, causing instability for the roster going forward. Ron Harper was apparently counting the days and would eventually leave for Chicago the following season. Yeah, lots of great little stories and bits and pieces there that uh, all lead to certain things happening in the ensuing couple of seasons. When Ron Harper says that he's counting the days, it shows you how unhappy he was being a part of that roster at the time. When the Clippers starters were announced, Dominique received a little extra emphasis on his name from the Hawks PA man and a fantastic ovation from the Omni crowd. The camera flashed into the crowd to show a so sorry Neek sign, a go get him Neek sign and a Dominique we still love you sign. After the Clippers starters, there was a real buzz in the arena as Neek gave a wave to the Hawks faithful that loved him for 12 seasons in Atlanta. I think all those signs were held up by players on the Hawks bench. <laughs> there was a pause before the Hawks were announced to give the fans a moment to thank Neek, which was enough time for Clippers guard Mark Jackson to push Wilkins out to the middle of the court to bask in the applause from the crowd. Nick was clearly emotional at the time, and I guess with very good reason. That was great stuff there from Mark Jackson. I really enjoyed that. He clearly understood the importance of the moment and made sure that Neek was aware of it as well pre-game. Let's get into the game itself, mate. In the first quarter, the Hawks showed superior ball movement, and they had a combo of Mookie Blaylock to Danny Manning back to Blaylock, who made the extra pass to a cutting Stacey Augman for an easy two. Neek's first shot was a baseline three. Ron Harper got the offensive board and the putback, and Atlanta were up 4-2 to two early on. Action Jackson, then the plastic man Stacey Augman, sensing the game's importance and wanting to impress from the get-go. They each attempted flashy no-look passes, <laughs> which both resulted in missed opportunities for their team. Of course, they're getting a bit caught up in the moment, I guess. Neek's first score of the game came on a beautiful lead pass at the rim from the Clippers' Mark Jackson. It was timed perfectly, and then Dominique brought up his first two points in the Omni as an opposition player. Stacey Augman, driving for a seemingly easy score, was rejected into the middle of 1995 by Charles Bow Outlaw. This was the rookie season for Charles Outlaw, and he got the call up from the CBA. He played a couple of 10-day contracts with the Clippers, and then he signed on for the rest of the season. He ultimately played 15 seasons in the NBA. And I'd have to think that Bow Outlaw would possibly make my all role player team. I think he was one of those guys that did all the intangibles, and Kind of came across as though he never took a game off. He was constantly moving. Great player to have on your roster, for sure. Danny Manning's first score of the game came on an easy layup. Then a graphic appeared on the screen which detailed the recent impact of Ron Harper. In his previous eight games, he averaged 28.8 points, 7.8 rebounds, and six assists, and three steals a game. So not long after, Harper led a four-on-two fast break for a pretty driving layup. And Ron Harper 
celebrated that great eight-game stretch with possibly one of his worst shooting games of his season, I think, in 94 in this one. Mm. Yeah, there's a couple of interesting stat lines by the time we get to the end of this game. Mike Stinger Glenn then mentioned the close relationship between Dwayne Farrell and Dominic Wilkins. He said that the two were very close friends and it would be hard for Dwayne to try and guard Neek given the situation of this game. The pair played five full seasons together in Atlanta and coincidentally or not, Dwayne's production post-trade would never be the same. Wilkins was waiting for a CONCAC double team and then found Bo Outlaw on a sweet baseline cut for a pretty pass and an even better finish. Outlaw hammered home a strong dunk. Later in the quarter, Mike Glenn is mentioning the upside of Neek's move to LA, including numerous movie role offers, talk that Magic Johnson wanted to have Neek play with the Lake Show, and of course, the extra money that Wilkins would earn, which was about $2 million a year, above and beyond his Hawks earnings. And if you go to imdb.com, you'll find that Dominic, I think, made zero extra movie appearances oh. due to his move to LA. I guess he had a lot of endorsement deals, and he probably would have upped those a bit in that time, but I can't remember him making any cameos in any movies, but please correct us if we're wrong. Um, just quickly, the 1994 season had so many plot lines, the biggest of which, of course, was MJ playing baseball. That aside, another fascinating story was that Magic Johnson had a brief tenure as Lakers coach. He went 5-11 and 11 in 16 games. His first game as Lakers coach was on March the 27th, just two days after this contest that we're talking about today. He started a very impressive 5-1, and one, and then the Lakers dropped 10 straight. And I believe I've heard Magic say that this 16-game stretch as Lakers head coach was enough for him to never want to do the job again. Understandably so. It'd be a very tough position, particularly given how much he achieved and accomplished with the Lakers as a player. So, yeah, he was always up against it. In the last two minutes of the quarter, Neek subbed out, and he was met by great applause from the Atlanta faithful. He was replaced by Harold Ellis, and I'm almost certain that his nickname was also Bo, the same as fellow teammate Charles Outlaw, for what it's worth. I think you're right. Anyhow, in 1994, Alice burst onto the NBA landscape and had a sudden, albeit brief, impact. He lit up the scoring column in a few of his early career games. January 8th of 94, he debuted with zero points. Then he scored six points the following game, but followed that up with 23 points at Philly and then 29 points at Boston, respectively. There was plenty of NBA action highlights, too, around this particular time. Yeah, you and I have discussed the on-fire segment from one of the NBA actions from the 94 season that Bo Ellis, I guess, <laughs> he appeared in. During this quarter, the commentators spoke about Dominique's first experience with an LA earthquake. Apparently, this happened in the middle of an elevator ride. They said, welcome to the coast, Neek. <laughs> After one quarter... The Atlanta Hawks had a lead, 22-21. to 21. Neek checked back into the game early in the second quarter and soon after drove in on Dwayne Farrell from the left wing. Across the middle, took the contact from Farrell and bounced in the finish for the and one. The commentator said that Neek had said he had tried as hard as he could to win over Hawks coach Lenny Wilkins but never truly felt he was a part of the offense. They continued with a good point saying that it has to hurt when any former player says that about you as a coach. I guess Neek's 30 shots a game didn't fit with Lenny Wilkins' style of game. He liked the more disciplined choreographed system on offense is what they said. In this game, the Clippers' offense wasn't at all pretty in the first half, and I think they actually dragged the Hawks down to their level throughout the game in order to keep it close. There were lots of out-of-rhythm jump shots in the middle of the shot clock showing no patience at the offensive end. Now, even I can admit that Neek wasn't a very good defensive player during his career, but as Dr. Jack Ramsey said on the back of Neek's 94-95 Skybox card, Wilkins was a poor defender but good ball stealer. Now, this as Neek picked the pocket of Andrew Lang on the next Hawks possession, which resulted in a Wilkins layup at the other end to give him 10 points and return that buzz from the crowd who appreciated the score and I guess basically any touch that Neek got during this game. The crowd were definitely into it, mate. They wanted Neek to do really well. I don't even think they overly cared. Perhaps I'm going a bit over the top there if the Hawks even won the game. At this point of the game, they flashed a statistical leaders graphic up on the screen showing that Neek was fourth in the NBA in scoring 
behind Shaquille O'Neal, David Robinson, and Akeem Olajuwon. Neek had bumped his scoring average late in the season by 1.2 points per game in just 12 games, showing that he was on a real tear. The score was 40-32 to 32 Atlanta with 4.26 remaining. And at this stage, the Hawks were showing their better record with open jump shots and easy fast break points. Neek struggled from the field in this first half. He then fixed this struggle from the outside with a drive across the middle on Stacey Ogwin for a finger roll. The commentators said that Hawks coach Lenny Wilkins was specifically denying Neek the baseline and wanted him forced into the middle. But Lenny wouldn't have been too happy with the revolving door that allowed Neek an easy two on this play. With 3-14 remaining in the second quarter, the following two clipper offensive possessions drew double teams of Neek out on the left wing. The first he passed out of. The second, he drove baseline away from the double team, then spin back to the middle for another layup on Ogman to the delight of the opposing Hawks fans. Dominique went into volume shooter mode at this point <laughs> as he got fouled after corralling his own miss on the next Clippers possession and then went back up with the lay-in plus the foul. The one made free throw gave him 15 points. Adam, you'd have to agree that Mookie Blaylock is one of the most underrated defensive terrors in NBA history, wouldn't you? Absolutely, mate. Hands down. Really good on the ball, pressure, always alert, looking out, helping his teammates as well off the ball. I, I would have loved to have seen him play on the Bulls, actually, because he was a, a foe uh, to the Chicago Bulls during the early to mid-90s as well. On the next possession, Bo Outlaw had the ball under the hoop and went up for the finish only to have Mookie Blaylock simply grab the ball whilst in his hands to tie Outlaw up, which led to a jump ball. It was a great show of strength from the much smaller Mookster. Off the jump ball, Neek grabbed the pill on the baseline near the hoop and throws a sweet up and under to give him 19 points. Now, I've heard on a couple of occasions that Neek only scored two points in the first half of this game and then exploded for 34 points in the second half. Hello to those who misled me, if you're listening. <laughs> and just another thing, you mentioned how Blaylock tied up Outlaw. <laughs> was that a pun? No, nah, that was <laughs> that was inadvertent. Accidentally. <laughs> I love it. The score was 45 to 53 in favor of Atlanta at the half with Neek contributing 19 of those. Another graphic showed that, that since the trade, the Hawks' scoring average had dipped from 103.4 to 98.6 points per game, and the Clippers went from 101.5 to 110.5. <laughs> the 18 and 35 Clippers had also gone six up and six down since the trade, which was an improvement for the Clips. Now, I have in my notes here, mate, that free throws kept the game close for the Clippers. They were 9 of 15, and Atlanta, in contrast, were just 2 of 2. So as we enter the third quarter, the Hawks had that eight-point lead, and it opened in style. <laughs> Wilkins airballed a long two. <laughs> Concac may have deflected it. I'll give him credit for that, perhaps. Then Blaylock barely grazed the iron on a wide-open three-point shot. Off a Blaylock assist, Kevin Willis then hit a nice 18-foot baseline jumper. Harper scored a few plays later on another sweeping drive to the hoop. He was really fun to watch back in this period of his career, so athletically gifted even after his injury troubles. The Clippers were fun to watch in transition. However, their Rams shackle style of play wasn't always pretty or effective, and then LA pulled to within four points, 55 to 51. Harper scored again, gathering a loose ball off an Almore Spencer dropped pass, skying in for the pretty up and under jam. The Hawks' lead was now just two. Lenny Wilkins had seen enough and called for time as the Clippers peeled off a 6-0 run to open the stanza. don't know why I kept going back to the word stanza, but I do. Kevin Willis abused Almore Spencer on the block, scoring another two off a great spin move to the hoop. Then the Clippers went almost four minutes without scoring as the Hawks regained control of the game. Then Dominique hit a perimeter jumper. It was the first that he made outside of about 14 feet. His inside game was responsible for his good scoring numbers thus far, 21 points. Starting with a strong Kevin Willis rebound, an outlet pass to Mookie Blaylock, he dished off to a slashing plastic man for the baby windmill with a left hand. Was that the dunk that he did kind of on or going past Elmore Spencer? I actually don't recall, to be honest. I just was so hyped up about the dunk. It literally was a baby windmill dunk. Yeah, there's one dunk that it sounds like it was this one. Um the other uh, memories failing me at the age of 37. 
<laughs> but there was one dunk left-handed that was an absolute hammer that he threw down. Well, that'd be it. And of course, you know, Augman was a lefty, but gee, it looked good because it was a great play in general. Willis got the rebound, which led to the outlet and then finished off with that awesome dunk. So it probably was, and I'm at age 39, mate, my memory's already gone. So you're ahead of me by a couple of years and many brain cells. That means in the next two years, I've got uh, something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, at this point, mate, I'd like to say that the play I'm about to mention has rocketed into my top 20 follow dunks of all time. Darren Blaylock, take a bow. Darren O'Shea Blaylock. Oh, well, yeah, if we want to go even one step further, (laughs) indeed. Off the CONCAC missed jumper, Mookie, 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 Mookie skied high and then Pearl jammed at home. The reaction was incredible from about four Clipper players on the bench, and that made it even better. It was incredible timing and a tip jam from a six foot. At best, Mookie Blaylock. And I always love a dunk when a player makes use of the breakaway rim, and Mookie did exactly that. But wasn't it a fantastic dunk? It was an awesome dunk. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And I actually considered asking you if I could swap to the first and third quarters (laughs) just so I could describe how awesome it was. It was a ripper. If you showed footage of the shot, you pause the tape, then say, what happens next? You would not pick in a thousand years. There'd be a follow dunk from Mookie Blaylock. So are you saying that we should do a, you fake the call? Here comes Dominic. <laughs> Could this possibly be a blooper? <laughs> but does he dunk some basketball bloopers? Anytime we can reference that is a good time. Now, a line drive three from Ronnie Harper reduced the Hawks' lead to seven as the third quarter drew to its conclusion, if I can learn to speak. Late in the quarter, Andrew Lang delivered I'll say an inadvertent elbow to Bo Outlaw, no pun intended, who went down for the count for a minute or so. He was winded most likely. That sort of play needs to be outlawed. Hmm. It was a uh, a pretty rough play from Andrew (laughs) Clubberlang. A rocky reference. Wow. Uh, Manning sat for most of this quarter because he was in foul trouble. And then LA Clippers' own John Williams hit a short jumper with tenths of a second left in the third to bring LA to within seven points at the break, 74 to 67. We've also actually heard since that Manning sat for most of this quarter because he wasn't as good as Dominique. (laughs) It was only a matter of time until you got at least one job in there. I digress. Mm -hmm. Nick's first score of the last quarter came off an outlet from Elmore Spencer as Nick beat the Hawks' D down court. Nick caught the pass and gave Craig Yellow a Trent Tucker-ish beautiful double clutch reverse dunk. Then two <laughs> possessions later, got to the hoop for the layup off a nice handoff from Randy Woods off the break to bring the lead back to 5, 76 to 71. Did you get the Trent Tucker reference? Out of nowhere, you've dropped Trent Tucker. Oh, you've lost me on that one. I don't actually know what it is. One of my favorite Dominic dunks is one that he did on the Knicks at Madison Square Garden. There was only Trent Tucker back. And instead of going up for a regulation one or two-hander, Nick gave him a soaring double-clutch reverse. Okay, okay. So there's history to it, of course. There's history to it, yeah. Anytime we can reference previous games, when we're already talking about games that happened in the past, it's a good thing. The next play, Elmore Spencer Haywood brought the ball up court in transition (laughs) and found Nick for another layup, the Georgia-to-Georgia connection, as the commentators mentioned Spencer and John Hotplate Williams were on the court for the Clips at this point to make up one of the more out-of-shape front lines in LA Clippers history. (laughs) They were both big boys. There's no doubt about that. And you don't get a nickname of Hotplate without good reason. (laughs) (laughs) The Hawks doubled Neek on the next possession as he was sizing up Danny Manning on the wing. Two passes later, Randy Woods hit a wide-open three on the opposite side of the court to tie the game at 76 with 9.26 left. The crowd was brought to life at this point as the Clippers had the momentum and had made a game of it for the Atlanta Hawks. And just quietly, mate, I think that Randy Woods mentioned, we've actually had two name drops in the last couple of minutes. That might be the first time he's been mentioned on the podcast history to date, which is good because I'm all for journeyman guys who just get plucked out of obscurity to get mentioned in uh, episodes like this. We do love our journeyman, don't we? We do. Atlanta started two for 12 from the field in the fourth quarter (laughs) as the Clippers were five for six in the same span. It was a real helter-skelter game down the stretch, really tightly played defensively, and both teams were a little sloppy at the offensive end, which kept it close. 
I think it was that Clippers bringing the Hawks back to their level, which I mentioned early on in the episode. With the Clippers down two, Neek finds Elmore Spencer in front of the hoop for a short shot over Kevin Willis to tie the game with 220 remaining. The commentators at this stage said how big it would be for the Clippers to win this game on Dominic's return to Atlanta. Blaylock continued his great game with a tip-in of a Willis-missed 18-footer as he snuck inside of Dominique to get great position for the carom. With 136 remaining and the Hawks up by two, Dominique made the circus shot of the game. With Elo guarding him in the post, he drove into the middle, jumped, gets met by John Konkak in the lane, who bumps him off balance midair. Then Neek hangs, twists, and puts in a crazy shot, plus the foul on Konkak. An amazing shot, and the subsequent free throw put the Clippers up by one and gave Dominique 34 points and some very loud cheers from the Hawks crowd on that play. Dominique really had a phenomenal, there we go, a phenomenal game, particularly this fourth quarter where he just owned the contest, single-handedly brought the Clippers back into it. John Konkak then put the Hawks back up by one with just over a minute remaining with a clutch 17-footer, a shot he hit on several occasions in this game and was clearly very comfortable taking it. The amazing finish to this game continued on the very next play. Ron Harper gunned a three from the corner that missed. Dominic skied over Craig Yellow for the offensive rebound and then flips in an amazing shot over the challenging John Konkak to again put the Clippers up by one and to give Neek 36 points. It was now that Atlanta were looking for that Dominic-type go-to guy to get them a score, but all they could muster was Kevin Willis in the post and an off-balance Mookie Blaylock floater with the ball eventually going out of bounds off Willis with 35.6 remaining on the clock. Apparently Kevin Willis argued the call, then the referee said, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Anyhow, that's a terrible different strokes mention. That's a good one. At the other end, the Clips were looking for Neek, who was well covered on the play. So Ron Harper came through after a really poor shooting night from the outside to bury a 19-footer from the elbow to put LA up three with 13.4 left, which led to an Atlanta Hawks timeout. Atlanta then scored on another basket. Two Ron Harper foul shots got the lead out to three, then a desperation Craigulo three from 30 feet was off the mark and the perfect scenario for Neek came to fruition in the Clippers' 97-94 to win. The Clippers almost reacted as if they'd won the NBA championship, let's be honest, but you'd give it to Wilkins and Harper and everybody else and Mark Jackson who was celebrating because they knew the importance of the game, coming back to Atlanta to then steal the victory and Neek had an absolute monster performance, so it was great to see all around. I think with the the other season that the Clippers had had up to that point, that any opportunity to, to celebrate, they would have taken it and ran with it. But I think that the occasion definitely merited the post-game celebration. Mm-hmm, indeed. Now, the Clippers held on to win 97 to 94. They moved to 25 and 41 on the season, and the Hawks conversely dropped to 47 and 20. For the Clippers, Neek had... A great performance, 36 points, 10 rebounds, and 3 assists. Ron Harper had 25 points and 6 rebounds. Mark Jackson had 11 points and 6 assists. Bo Outlaw had 11 rebounds, and Elmore Spencer dragged in 10 boards. For Atlanta, Kevin Willis had 23 points and 14 boards. The Plastic Man had 22 points, 12 rebounds, and 4 steals, if you don't mind. That's a great effort there. And Mookie Blaylock had 15 points and 14 assists. Danny Manning did struggle. He had 6 points on just 3 of 10 field goals, so... I guess he would have felt the pressure. The fact that the Hawks fans were obviously willing Dominique to pretty much have a fantastic game to the detriment of Danny Manning, you have to imagine. After this game, the Clippers went 2-14 and 14 to end the season. <laughs> the Hawks went 10-5 and five to finish their regular season before losing to the Pacers in six games in the 1994 Eastern Conference semis. During the post-game interview that the guys had with Dominique, they asked him, Nick, how did you feel during the player introductions before the game? Dominique said, I was jacked. The fans were unbelievable. During this interview, Dominique singled out rookie Bo Outlaw. He was excellent in this game with his hustle. He was doing all the little things that he became so well known for during his 15-year NBA career. And isn't it great that it actually spawned from a couple of 10-day contracts Then he signed with the team to finish the season out and were going to be, as you said, one of the great role players that you'd love to have on your team for well over a decade to come. Yeah, don't have to answer if you don't wish. (laughs) 
<laughs> You're still not answering. Oh, that's awkward. All right. Was that a question? I uh, thought it was a question. Anyhow, that's fine. We'll move on. Now, uh, that's the game, mate. Thanks again for being part of the show. Anything you wanted to add before we finish off this episode? After making the trade that derailed the Hawks shot at a NBA championship, Danny Manning then jettisoned for Phoenix the following season after only playing 26 games with the Atlanta Hawks. So, Pete Babcock, giddy up. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. Tap the microphone icon on my website to send me a voicemail. You can suggest discussion topics or guests you'd like to hear conversations with. Worldwide, the show has 181 ratings on Apple Podcasts with an average of four and a half stars with 96 reviews across all providers. Thanks for your continued support. If you add a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Word-of-mouth recommendations are truly worth their weight in gold. Stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my free NBA history newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming episodes, future guests to appear on the show, and more. Sign up via my website or simply email me, inallairness at gmail.com. You can follow my show in various ways. Search In All Airness, three words, on your listening app of choice. The show is available on most platforms. Check the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with a great range of guests. My Instagram and Twitter handle is at In All Airness. Search In All Airness on YouTube and Facebook too. Join me next time for another edition of the show.